Hello and welcome to the Screen Chronicles. I'm Colby and with me as always is Steve. Now if you've listened to us before, you've probably heard us praise the cinematography from The Last Kingdom. And today we are very fortunate to be joined by the director of photography for seasons one, two, and three of The Last Kingdom, Chaz Bain. Welcome to the Screen Chronicles. Thank you very much, guys. It's very nice to be here. How are you doing? Uh, I'm all good. I'm um, COVID free and um, I'm up a mountain somewhere in the Alps. And oh. uh, just uh, yeah, just chilling at the moment, try, w- trying to work out my next move. Okay, cool. Very, very cool. Cool. What are you doing during the day to keep yourself busy? Uh, quite a lot of things. Well, I've got two kids, so that takes up a, a quite <laughs> a lot of my day. But um, yeah, there's a lot of adventure to be had out here. So, uh, so you know, I've got paragliding, tennis, running, skiing, skiing in the winter, obviously. Yeah, there's a lot to do out here. So, um, you know, I'm very fortunate to be here. Yeah, just looking at your Instagram, it looks like you're very into all those uh, extreme kind of uh, yeah. things to do, like yeah. paragliding. Yes, it's extreme. <laughs> extreme is a bit of the, my middle name, I th- would say. Oh, really? that's, that's why I did The Last Kingdom, because it was quite an extreme show, I thought. When it was it first landed on my app, I thought, wow, this is quite a show. That's one thing we heard is uh, we, we were talking to Rune Attempte a while ago, and he was telling us that... Yeah. Uh, he was one of the big ones I was pushing for us to talk to you. He was like, oh, you guys going to get Chaz. And he's like, he would get uh, into the shield walls with the camera and was shooting. Yeah. 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 Number one, what I wanted to say about it, the whole thing is, you know, I'm so proud of it uh, because um, A, it's a good show, but B, also the way that we became such a tight family um, and uh, everyone was, there was sort of no egos and we all knew that it was a really hard thing to do. You know, facing the Hungarian winter, making a show like this in the style that we did it, which people hadn't really done before, sort of as real as possible, as opposed to over glamorizing the right. cinematography and, and, you know, just getting that feel that you were really, really there at that time. And that was the whole, that was the whole remake, which Nick Murphy, who I think you had on before, yeah. he sort of, um, he, he came, he, I'd been working with him. And um, he came to me and said, uh, look, I'm up at this thing called The Last Kingdom with Carnival. I said, oh, great. Not realizing that he was asking me to do it. He then took me to Carnival to meet the execs, Gareth and Nigel. And um, I didn't realize I was being interviewed. I was just coming <laughs> on for the ride. And it wasn't until Gareth said to Nick, Show, tell me what your style is, this sort of, um, this new style that you've got. And then, he stopped and he looked around at me and I didn't really know what was going on. He said, actually, Chaz, you tell me what the style's going to be. And I went, and I looked at Nick and his whole mantra was there in my hand. Oh my and God. fortunately, I knew what he had up his sleeve. So I sort of spouted this off as he was looking at me, horrified that I was going to screw it up. <laughs> but um, yeah, but I, I knew, you know, I knew that it was going to be uh, an exciting show and, and you know that just everybody was was so tight on it and it was a big thing for you know people leaving their homes for long periods of time like I was away for like eight months or nine months you know sporadically back and forth to, the, to home um, but I was I felt so passionate that I wanted to do the whole thing I didn't really want to give it to anybody else and they okay. fortunately they let me let, let me carry on with it um, and I'm, I, I give thanks to the producers for letting me do that. But, you know, the team was amazing. You know, we're all together. There was no sort of actors, camera department, art department. Everyone was a group and everyone pulled together. I know people say this all the time, but it was the first time in like 25 years of this business that I felt like um, it was a real, real team effort that everyone wow. was very respectful of other people's jobs. And... Um, yeah, they were everyone's friends. Everyone's still friends, you know. Yeah, that's the impression we get is that everyone sort of learned about each other's roles and really got on together. Um, you know, we just had Ruby Hartley on. She was telling us about how she learned about the other, you know, roles that were involved in the show just from being on. So that was, it was pretty cool. I'm, you know. Yeah, and, you know, for, for the show, for the budget that we had, you know, Shitty and Hungry meant that we could go big on the sets. And that's what. You know, in the first season, Martin John, who um, was the production designer, really sort of pushed the boat out and got, you know, the sets were absolutely amazing. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and very real. And, and, and my, the style, you know, because we wanted it real, 
as far as I was concerned, it was daylight the day, and then it was fire and moonlight by night. And that was as real as I can make. So it's not sort of like, you know, it, it wasn't over glamorizing. It was using what, and I, there were tricks that I sort of learned, you yeah. know, with firelight that I could sort of employ that was quick, as opposed to burning actual fire. I sort of made these LED lights that you could record flame into, uh, oh. a digital flame. And then you could just quit if you want fire on someone's face, instead of putting a massive great fire right next to them, you know, which is obviously awkward and dangerous and all the rest of it, you know, it's very quickly done. Speed was of the essence, you know, we had a lot to do. Uh, every day was like a trial. Okay. Ten, 10 hours every day, you're standing outside at minus 12. I'm sure all the boys have told you, you know, it's minus 12, minus 15 and you know, you're there every day doing it, and it always comes down to the last 30 seconds. You know, turn over, turn over, turn over. Yeah. You know, it's all that crazy shit. And then you finish, and you're like, Phew. you're just exhausted. And, it, you know, and so it goes on. Oh, my um, goodness. So hard. it was hard, but incredibly rewarding. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. So you just talk about the, the amount of hours you put in. Could you kind of describe the scope of the job of director of photography? on the last kingdom okay so in the initial stages you know it was you know you're sort of finding your feet and we had about i suppose six weeks prep nick and i so we land in budapest wow. and uh, and you know we've got the scripts and we start doing meetings and the art department starts coming together the wardrobe department and then i start shooting some tests you know firelight tests how are we going to do this how can we go big but <laughs> the curveball that I got from Nick, I don't know if it, I, he probably will be watching this, was he said to me, I want to be able to shoot 360 degrees, right? So that's fine in daylight because, you know, you can get away with it. But in the interiors, you know, that's, uh, there was a lot of top light and you can really notice it to begin with. You know, as a, as a cinematographer, that's quite a bitter pill to swallow. You know, okay. uh, I said that the running joke with Nick was, this is fine for you, but I've got to get another job on the back of this. <laughs> you know, it's all right for you to shoot the actors in every direction. Uh, but it meant that we were very quick on our toes and we could, and he spent more time with the actors, which they love. Um, and, and, you know, the whole cast loved Nick. And, well, they loved all the directors, to be honest. The top light just meant we could be really quick. But the, what I wanted to say was that the series then morphed into, as I got more, once I could work out the tricks and the speed, it became much more, I don't know, more polished as you go gotcha. on. But still still with the rawness. Anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. The, the points of cinematography, so it's like, you've got the prep time, then we start shooting, and it's like, you know, here we go, we're off and running. You know, it's like a horse race. It's suddenly, bam, you're yeah. off. In the first season, we only had one camera because we were shooting 360, so there's no way that we could, we could have two cameras on the go. But then the scale of the job, I suppose, is wrecking all, all the, the night stuff. In all that prep, you've got to get all the nights nailed down and, you know, where you're gotcha. going to put the big equipment. And, and, you know, it got bigger and bigger as I got a bit more ambitious and, and found my legs, really, because it was a big show to suddenly land into. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I, I was incredibly fortunate to get the gig. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm so proud of it, and I think I hope I've done a decent job on it. But does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. And I think yeah. that you're a big part of what gave the show the opportunity to grow in scale. Um, you know, you and obviously the directors who did a wonderful job. But those first initial episodes, especially one and two, with that handheld feel is a very unique feel. And I got to say, I went back and rewatched a lot of these scenes to, and tried to pretend I was holding the camera. And, yeah. um, and I still would forget that someone was holding the camera, which I think is a goal of a cinematographer. And even when I was consciously trying to think. So it, you really did a great job of that. Well, that's very kind. I mean, I'm a little bit overcritical of, of that because, um, you know, to be honest, it, that wouldn't stand up on on a big screen that, that would be you know if that was a cinema show that, that would be too much i mean it was right on the edge of roughness and the thing was that we didn't use any stabilized heads and when we're traveling with horses i'm in a quad 
and I'm okay. handheld and I'm just taking as much as I can, but you still have the, the feeling of being there. Anyway, uh, as the show progressed, um, uh, we, when we were doing all the horse stuff, because I wanted to soften that off a bit, because, you know, if you're doing a long dialogue scene on horseback, yeah. you know, there's a certain, it's fine to duck in and out with a bit of action, but fine, if you're talking and it's going like this, it's, it's no good. So what we did was you put the Steadicam arm on the back of the quad, so you still have that float, okay. and it's not so manic. And, you know, the frame line can duck, as long as it's not going down here, but, you know, you can, you've got a bit of that going on. But it feels like you're, you're with the horse. It almost feels like you're on the horse, you know? Yeah, it um, does. But that, yeah, one and two was, was pretty rough. Uh, I, did, I operated one and two, and then I realized the workload was getting quite a lot for me to operate and light. Uh, once I started to want to do directional lighting, you know, I couldn't be lifting the camera, looking at a shot, going off to the monitors, you know, changing the aperture when we're during the shot. You know, it, it, there was a lot to ask. So I was very fortunate to be able to employ operators after one and two. But okay. yeah, I did one and two. Very but so, thank you for that. Yeah. So what was it like? Um, you mentioned about the challenge that Nick Murphy kind of brought with that freedom of the actors. And you as a cinematographer, yeah. all of a sudden you have to react. So can you talk a little bit about yeah, that um, challenge? Well, that challenge was, I to begin with, I was... I was going, oh my God, how am I going to do this? Um, and um, I just realized that because it was natural, uh, right. because we're going natural, you know, natural light comes from above. So, and I also, we did some tests and we realized that in the grade, you know, we can, we can, we can spend a little bit more time in the grade to make it a little, not so, you know, we can lift people's eyes because with a lot of top light, you get shadow in here okay. and we can, we can isolate these bits and, and bring out the eyes. So there was, there was a lot more work to be done in one and two in the grade. But gotcha. it just meant, you know, we spent that time afterwards sort of correcting what was pretty sort of quite raw lighting in order, in order to give it the real effect, if you like. Um, and then obviously it sort of became a little, a little bit more directional, uh, but still natural light. And um, as the season progressed, and you know, as once you get to season three, I think that's when I realised that I, I got it to where I wanted it to be. Okay, very cool. Yeah, one of the the big things I always felt about the show, especially when we first started watching it, drew us into it was just how natural all the lighting was, and when yeah. you're, I, I remember all the scenes, even when it didn't look really pretty. It, it just felt so real. I mean, and it was still beautiful. The thing, I remember like the, the shot where Alfred is on the hill and who Uhtred comes up to him in uh, the first yeah, yeah. season, you know, after he's catching on to how Alfred's starting to use him essentially. And it's, yeah. it's like yeah. kind of early morning look about it. Uh, it, but it, but it still looked really like beautiful out there. Yeah. I mean, that's, I guess as a cinematographer, you know, you've got a spot where those, where those key locations are. Gotcha. You know, I, when we wreckied, when we wreckied that area, we, that place was called Blue Moon Valley. Hmm. And it's about 40 minutes out of Budapest. And I saw, I, I'd seen on the wrecky, I thought, Jesus, sun setting over there behind those hills. That's got to be good for some key moments here. And I mean, I'll give you the, there's a bit of a steel here that, you know, we got that amazing shot with Alfred and, and, um, uh, and Alex on, on the hill there. But I also closed season one with the same location. I don't oh. know if you spotted that. It's when uh, we're over the top of the horses and yes. Alex rides away. Well, we had three stunties, obviously, and we followed them on the optocopter and then we just tilted up as they rode off into the sunset. You know, I'd said, uh, Peter Hoare, who's the director, had said, yeah. we need to come up with a shot for um for the closing of the season and i in, in you know i wanted to do it's got to be riding into the sunset i mean christ it was almost like a, i'd always wanted to do it. it's almost like shooting a plane landing at the airport you know it's the classic shot with the yeah. tires coming down all that kind of stuff and so peter went yeah that's great now show me what it's like so we did it and 
that that was the location that I, I knew. I used it twice, but I knew it was a it was a winner. So that's I guess going back to the cinematography thing, you know, just spotting the the the, the good spots, knowing what time of day to get up there, making sure you've got the equipment to balance the light. You know, the light once you're fighting the sun, you know, right. you've got to balance all the lights. It becomes sort of second nature, but to begin with, you know, you, you have to sort of get it in your brain. What am I going to need on the top of this hill? I've got two stump, I've got three stump men, I've got an octocopter, I've got the, we're running out of light. Is the makeup department ready? Is the wardrobe department ready? Come on, guys, we're about to lose wow. it. You know, it's all that. So, so it's a, you know, it's the DOP, you've, re, you've got to feel it all and get everyone going. Um, yeah. And I guess there's a way of doing that in a nice way. <laughs> and I guess sometimes I would guess moments might come up that you don't anticipate. Does that ever happen? Where you're like, oh, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, bad weather. You know, in uh, in season three, um, when the battle, uh, when uh, Edward is being is being forced by Alfred to make a decision whether to come out, right? So we started yeah. we started that scene in sort of rain what the first day by the end of that day and we're already heavily into the scene the place was fucking white sorry i'm not i swear uh, no, the you're place fine. Was white. so it's, it's completely snowed under and yeah. i was going i was thinking well what are we gonna do and john east who was the director on that he's very practical and he said well we just got to go with it i mean what are we gonna do so when we got back to the grave once again we you know and a bit of visual effects work we made the whole thing in snow and it looked amazing. But <laughs> the conditions to work with was absolutely, you know, the mud. You know, you always hear about Game of Thrones mud. We had some serious mud and it was minus 15. Um, you know, it melted during the day and, you know, in the afternoon it gets cold and cold. In the morning it's like ridiculous. So, yeah, there, there, there's curveballs that come up, uh, mainly with weather, I would say. or Right. You know, equipment failure, generator goes down, what are you going to do? How are you going to get around that? Um, you know, there's always, you're just solving problems, basically, the whole time. Right. Um, and, you know, in the morning, when you turn up, and you get out of that van, then, you know, you've got to make some decisions. You know, you, you've had a look at it, you know what's going to happen, but you need to look at the weather and, you need to know where the equipment's going to go because you've got to think that much further down the line of, you know, of, I can't be finishing the shot and go, oh my God, we've got everything to, in, on the reverse of that shot. You know, you need yeah. to think about where the sun's going to be. You want the sun in the best shot. But, so it's just that thinking ahead thing the whole time. Um, totally. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say the weather and equipment failure really was, was the uh, things that go wrong. Okay. Is, it, is it more challenging than like shooting another drama that's you know mostly indoors or or you're on set? Yeah, yeah, because, yeah. Because a we got the battles, you know, mm. and um, when you're first faced with a battle in under those conditions, uh, it's like oh my god. But um, you know, you get the hang of it after a while. But you know, when you got lots of horses, uh, you got a lot of stuntmen fighting and there's sometimes a communication problem between the Hungarian and the English, not always, oh, yeah. but sometimes that happens, you know, uh, and there's a certain danger element to that. Speaking of the uh, moment at that Bianfliot battle where Alfred and Edward have to make that decision because it is one of Stephen R's favorite moments from The Last Kingdom. And we, in fact, we forgot it was two episodes separate. We just always imagined it as one moment. Yeah, no, he, he's, the pressure's been put on him and then you cut to black and it starts the next episode, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. How can you not keep going, though? How, how, <laughs> it's just like you can't stop yeah. there. You can't go do something else. <laughs> I know. Well, that, listen, I'll tell you what. I, that, I wanted to say something about this. That You know, Stephen Butchard, he really, he, he, he is the man. And when I first read the scripts, I was thinking, because there's humour, there's political manoeuvring, so obviously you need to set each episode up and get the drama right to the end to stop. And he was an absolute master of that. And to condense those books into what he did, I think is absolutely amazing. And even yes. Bernard Cornwall said, you know, when he first watched season one, uh, I met him in an interview and he said to Nick and myself, he said, you've done it proud. You know, you really, 
And we were so chuffed with that because that's a hell of a thing from the yeah, writer. And we were thinking, well, actually, I think it was probably Stephen who nailed it, who gave us the opportunity to excel, if you like. But yeah, yeah, Stephen Butchard, he's, uh, he's a hell of a guy. Yeah, I mean, to pack so much into one show and to not have it feel rushed or too oh, yeah. much, you know, it, it flows so well for how much is in it. It's amazing. Yeah, you, you don't feel short change, that's for sure. And, yeah. uh, you know, one of, one of Nick's great skills, when he comes to editing, you know, he, he keeps the energy going. You'll, you'll never see in, in any of his episodes, like, a scene ending where, you know, the last line's been said and, you're left for that moment and then you cut. He's because you're on the move the whole time. Right. If someone's delivered a line, he Nick wants them to do something else. And uh, if they're gonna go off somewhere, I'll go and follow them. And then he'll cut just that they're, they're going. So you're always you're always moving. You're like, where where is this going? So you're totally engaged as opposed to finish the scene. Next shot. Do you know what I mean? So oh, Nick, yeah. Nick Nick is very good at doing that and i think i think that sort of led into there's a lot of energy in in all all of the shows but you know everyone does it differently but but i think you know those one and two really set up the pace of the show it does and you know in a funny sort of way there was a lot to live up to nick really laid down the the, the uh, gauntlet there to everybody else but you know what everyone picked it up yeah. yeah, I mean, I've, I'm friends with all of them now. It's because it's such an experience, and and I really like to be on a personal level with all these people, you know, and yeah, beer with them, and uh, and a lot of humour. Oh my god! And a lot of a lot of the other thing I learned about you know running a show like that is self-deprecation gets yeah. you a long way. Yeah, for sure. As opposed to sort of being a tyrant and, you know, you still get things done. You still think want your team to be slick, which my team was so slick. Yeah, but I think sense of humour on set is so important when you're in difficult times. Oh, I bet. You've got to keep, and, and I think the actors will, will bear up to that. that you know, we, there were a lot of laughs on set. Yeah. You know, people yeah. getting on horses, like Harry getting on a horse. You know, he'd try and get on the horse and, you know, he'd be in the background. We're, we're on Alex or something. And in the background, you see Harry trying to get on the horse five times. And then, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll turn around to Harry and go, I think I'm going to have to give you a four for that one. <laughs> anyway, you know, but, but it's all, it's all tongue-in-cheek oh. stuff and, uh, oh, yeah, and yeah. it's all a bit of a laugh. Bit of a laugh. That's what you just have like. a horse around with each other, right? Horse, horse Well, around? yeah, it was a bit of horsey, horsing around. Very funny. Um, <laughs> but that's cool that you guys keep it loose. It's awesome. Yeah, no, it was. Yeah, I, I mean, I talk a lot about that because for years, you know, I've, I've worked on a lot of shows over the years and, you know, that, that sort of, you know, everyone's terrified, treading on eggshells and, that, and I, I'm like, this is a negative energy. You know, right. you've got to, but you, people have got to read the situation, gauge the situation. If we've got like two minutes to go, and we've got to get this shot, then people doing that uh, <gasps> klaxon are probably it's not going to go down so well. Right. But, you know, choose your moment. And um, there were, the actors have no egos. Alex is so professional. Um, and he absolutely, you know, the, the most important thing for him was sleep because he's the showrunner, you know. Yeah. The other guys, could had a, the pressure was off them a little bit so they could muck about. But Alex was absolutely on the money. And I feel like when you create an environment like that, you probably just get the best out of everybody. And, and not you just do. the actors, the cinematographers, costume, whoever. Yeah, I think so. I don't know if everyone would agree with me, but I, I, I just think the atmosphere on set is really important. Uh, yeah. Because I've been on loads of sets where everyone is terrified of being fired. And, you know, it's just a really unhealthy... Uh, you know, it's, it's not the way that I want to work. And to be honest, you know, I'm I'm, I'm waiting for the next job there because uh, I want to work with I want to work with people that I like. Um, yeah, you know, and I met I've got so many nice directors on this show. That that was another advantage of doing all the episodes. You get to meet a load of directors. Yeah, and they've all been you know all selected by Gareth and Nigel at Carnival, who you know they know what they're talking about. 
Um, and those, all those directors, you know, there's a real opportunity for them all. Like Jamie Donny, who was an Oscar nominated director yeah. uh, for his short shock. And um, when, when Nigel came to me to say, we found doc director for block three. And I said, okay, who is it? He said, uh, well, he hasn't done any TV before. And I was like, okay, let's quite a show this. What, what are you talking about? He said, but he was Oscar nominated for his short. And I was like, oh my God. Right, you know, we're right in the heat of battle and all this stuff. Anyway, so I meet Jamie thinking he's not going to be able to carry this. And he absolutely smashed it. And it was his, it was, it was his idea to do the big one when we're chasing Millie through the, you know, when... Um, Death is coming. Remember yes, when season two? Oh yeah. my god! Yeah, season two. Death is coming, and uh, the story to this is that uh, uh, Jamie said, "Look, I really want to, I really want to do this as a one and I start because we've done a lot of oneers. That was one of our thing, you know, switching actors out, get, having a stunt done, losing the stunt man, then the actor walking in, all those tricks, right. which is really fun as an operator. That's you know, really fun to do all that stuff." Um, Anyway, so he, Jamie said, right, I want to do a one I want to see her come out of the tent. Death is coming, bell, bell. And we walked through, he found the shot, and he goes, in a one And I went, we can't do it in a one It's impossible. He said, no, no, but I want to do it. And I said, we can do it in a 3 with some digital stitching. I reckon we can do it. Uh, but I said, your first hurdle is you've got to get through Gareth and Nigel because, you know, it's a big moment. There's a lot going on. To have it in the one we've only got a day to do it so um finally we pitched it to gareth and nigel with our three breakdowns of whether where the digital stitches were and the first one is you, we run off with uh tura and then she she gives over to a, a, a swordsman who raises his sword right that we go up with the sword that's the first stitch when we come down okay. with the sword i've given the camera now to Leventi, the stuntman and we built a special cage for the camera because we want to be hit by the horse. And we do want to get, we want to be, we want the camera hit by the horse. So we made a grip team, put this thing together. We put the camera in a tube, a load of foam around it, no sharp edges. And Lamenti, who's like the horse whisperer, gets this horse to mow him down. I don't know if you remember. Yeah. And it's like from, from below and the horse goes over it too. Yeah, well, he goes, but, and then we get it. Uh, but then the camera goes on its side. Yes. And then the side goes quiet as if he's been knocked out and goes still. And then the camera writes itself again, starts crawling, and then we're off again. So uh, that, that was the next stitch after that. Um, so one, two, I think, no, maybe it was two stitches. But it meant that we could coordinate the green screens that we put in to time the horses coming towards... You know, we can't, you know, if you're looking at that wide shot and there's 50 horses charging towards, we can't keep resetting that and running them. We do it once against a green screen. Then when, every time you see them, you can move them a bit closer to get the drama more on top of you when she's running around. You know, death is coming. Yeah. Can, so, yeah, that, that one was, that was a, a key thing. And that was all Jamie's idea. And hats off to him. He, it, we nailed it. I think we really oh did. God. We had quite a lot of comments about that. And it's uh, chaotic. Think, uh, yeah. Christian was telling yeah. us, right, Coley? Christian yeah, was Christian. telling us that you, did you get injured during that scene? No, that was my, my operator. <laughs> uh, he, he, um, I'd done about, I don't know, 10 of them. And I was knackered. I was, it was about 30 degrees. You wouldn't believe it uh, because we grayed it all down. But it was really, really hot. Yeah, and you're just sprinting with the camera basically uh, and having to avoid everything and you know it's, it's, it's quite hard work anyway so Ian my new operator said look Chaz do you want to have a break I'll do one and I said <laughs> mate knock yourself out literally so Ian went and he did a really really good shot and right at the end he's done the whole thing and right at the end he's he's um he runs into the woods and it starts to go dark on the monitors. Okay. And I think Bjorn, one of the brothers, is onto Millie. Of the camera went down and I, th I didn't know what had happened. Anyway, Ian, poor Ian, he tripped on a branch. You know, he's running full tail. He tripped. And on top of the camera, there's a metal handle that sticks up. 
you know, it's really nasty bit of metal. He's tripped and the thing has gone into his ribs here. And he's he's in a lot of pain. And to his credit, he he came back and he finished the season. I mean, he should have gone home really. He had a crack game. <laughs> he couldn't really he couldn't really breathe properly or anything, and he insisted he stay on. I was like He wanted okay. to redeem himself after uh, saying, Oh Chaz, I got this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was, but it wasn't in no way demeaning to him because he was brilliant on the show, and uh, he, you know there's a lot of effort that's put in by the operators. Oh my God. Sean, Sean Savage, who we were lucky to have, from he's the Game of Thrones a camera operator, oh, and wow. he sort of he took over for um, the the last the last four episodes of season one. So we got that okay. great battle, you know, the fighting at the end of when Alfred is no mercy. Yes, which which still gives me goose pimples oh now. That David Dawson is just he's out of order. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> he, yeah. He, I, I, he was um, he was just a, such a pleasure to work with. Uh, but you know, when he did that speech, I was you know I was amazed because I I'd looked into the you know I knew the history of it. But to think that this place, Chippenham, Ethendon, which is, I've driven past that place in, in England. It's on the M4 motorway heading west. I've driven past there all my life. But, you know, in 872, 8,000 people turned up that morning. I mean, Mike. where did they have breakfast? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where did they go to the loo? And they knocked seven shades of shit out of each other. <laughs> and, and... And Alfred won. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Which um, is sort of relevant today with the galvanisation of, you know, if you can get the, the the weaker side to believe in themselves, you know, that they, uh, you know, believe in God and get everyone behind you and you can you can knock it out of the park. Because, you know, the Vikings were all just having a bit of a laugh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Whereas Alfred had galvanised all these people into God fearing, and uh, won the day, which is still it's amazing. That they it is did amazing, that. and how it actually happened is just it's just and you guys captured it so well. Yeah, well, it's just, you know, I, I get I get carried away talking about it because I'm so interested in it. Now. I didn't I didn't realise, you know, I didn't know all this stuff, and and like the north of England has got so much. A Nordic history, and a lot of the towns are called after you know the Viking names. Yeah, it, it was a real, it was a journey. You know, it was an interesting journey, and it was real. That that was one of the things that I loved about it. It was that you know it was real. And, it was real. Uh, yeah, it was real. It was interesting, and you know that's what we tried to bring to the show, the reality of it. So, were you interested in that history before you got on the show, or was it the no. show that inspired it? No. No, that was totally inspired by the show. Wow. Yeah, wow. Cool, cool. Yeah. And so Nick told us about another moment that made him feel like he was back in time was when on, on the those boat. Viking ships. That Do you remember was, that? I, 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 I had a tear in my eye. I, I kid you not. When we did, he told you when we rowed out, right? Nick had insisted that we're doing it on a Viking ship. And I was like, oh my God, we're going to go to sea on a Viking ship and shoot a scene. Only Nick Murphy. <laughs> I said, look, I'd say to him, look, let's just put it on a green screen, build the boat, move it around. He's like, no, 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 no. We're going on a Viking ship in the North Sea. And you know what? We nailed it, but we had the weather on our side. True. Had that been a different weather situation, that would have been the disastrous event but um just going back to that it was it was uh, i know you've heard the story before but from my from my side was that you know we got all these volunteers we rode out we had all the kit that we needed the actors were all ready to do their scene and as they as we got out into the fjord where the wind was all the road all the oars are stored in a certain way and up the middle of the boat and everything on that boat is of 872 the technology is 872 apart from an emergency beacon but it's all exactly as it was and at the middle the rope was covered in tar because that's what they used to stop it perishing in salt water so we all pull this really heavy sail up and as it goes up it sort of gets doing, 
and then suddenly it catches the wind and we just went wow and I just looked back and I was like my god this is it this is what they did this is where they went and discovered countries they sailed they got to the Black Sea in these things there's no roof on it right well, I think Nick said it best. That was like the space shuttle for its time. Exactly. And there was a special idiosyncrasy of the boat where these bubbles off the back of the boat, you had these spirals of bubbles. And I don't know what they signified, but you look out the back of the boat and people talk about them and it's some sort of pressure gradient or something. And it's distinctive of the boat. I don't know. I can't remember what it was, but the back of the boat, one side is slightly different than the other. How the fuck did they work that out? Anyway, so Crazy. yeah, that, and then it was finished up with beers, the most expensive beers I think I've ever <laughs> had, uh, with uh, Alex Villam, Kiartan, and the gang. And, you know, the, those, they see I, those moments, uh, they're few and far between. They really yeah. are. And they were with great people. Are there any moment, other moments that you can remember that you were shooting it, and as you were shooting it, you were like, wow, this is magic. This is... Um, this is something special. I'm sure there's a lot, well, but yeah, I I think uh, well, you know, when you got it right with the with the with the countryside and the sun, and you know, Alex is seen when he's come back from the slave ship. I was going to ask you about this, uh, and we got the bee landing on his finger or whatever it was. You know, that was that was pretty lucky. That was Sean Savage being clever. Uh, but yeah, there was some yeah hard. Oh, there's so many, you know, real, when, when you've got it and you come back and you think, that was really good. I'm just really proud of that. Because it doesn't yeah. always happen, you know. It's when everything comes together. And, and on that show, a lot, of, you've got it a lot of times. Wow. Where, you know, there was a lot of shit that we had to get through. <laughs> but yeah. uh, every, as they say, uh, even a blind squirrel finds a nut every now and again. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, I I, I feel I feel I, there's a lot of luck involved. What what's my favourite saying? They, I think that there was a famous cinematographer. I, well, I won't mention his name, but he said that cinematography is ninety nine percent luck, one percent talent. <laughs> well, come on. What can I, I say? <laughs> we think there's a skill to it. You have to be lucky and you, you make your own luck, is what I say about that. Is, uh, you know, you've got to get yourself in those positions to get the nuggets. And when you gotcha. do, it's great. Um, for me, you know, once you get in the grade and it's cut and it looks good and, and everything's done and you see what you've created, um, you know, so watching that one I was brilliant. Uh, the, I love, I still love the... Uh, you know, the end to season one, you know, the, the shot that I talked about earlier, riding up into sunset. Then I did a similar thing, you'll probably have seen, I did it at the end of season three as well. Because it was warranted because he was going somewhere and we wanted to know he was off again. Yeah. And those shots, you know, they look really cool. If you get it right, and that shot, which I did with Ed, Ed once again said, look, go and shoot the end of season three. So once again, I took Alex and we've got... It was through the woods after the battle. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. and it zooms. And, yeah, and, and we're following, being, yeah. following, and we watch him go off into those hills. Similar sort of shot, but pretty, pretty spectacular. And you know, once the music's on the board and, yeah. and it's the end of the show, you're like, yeah, that is cool. Um, yeah. So yeah, there, there, there was some special times. Alex fighting in Ed's uh, at the end of season three. That battle was really, really good. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very proud of that. I'm proud of all of them, but you know that that was pretty cool. Yeah, what you, just, I was going to ask you what what was your favorite battle? Oh, uh, episode four uh, at is it Dunholm Kjartan's yeah. Fort? Oh my god, Kjartan's Fort. Yes, at that's night. my favorite. Well, they uh, yeah, it was at night. At first, they snuck in, and then. In the morning, they charged and they snuck in the back of the fortress. Oh, well, it's, that's when um, Ragnar uh, brings the the front Ragnar, door down. Ragnar, Uhtred's in the Ragnar back. Ragnar kills him. Yeah. yeah, he keeps going. He keeps going at him. Yes. Yeah, that was pretty good. That was Sean Savage once again. He operated on that, but that's a, another thing. That was 
to get the you know the sun's moving around so we we right. shift the fight around for the light and you know we we end up at that point of Sven gets killed by the dogs, doesn't he? Yeah. Yes. Does he? Oh, yes, yeah. Yes. By his own dogs. That's mm-hmm. quite gruesome. And then, yeah. uh, <laughs> then uh, Ragnar goes absolutely off his head and can't stop stabbing. But yeah, that was a good one. That um, that was when they broke through the. Yeah, they had. Um, Stay up. And Stay up coming through, and they were already in there. Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah. God, there's so many of them. I can't remember them all, yeah. but they were all. What about you? <laughs> well, I, it's hard for me to pick a favorite battle, but there's a couple moments from battles that I wanted to ask you about. And one yeah. is the final battle of season two. The moment when Siegfried breaks through the shield wall as it's closing, and it's a it's a overtop view. Yeah. And the timing um, so, of that is phenomenal. Oh, oh when he goes up when he when he jumps over and then Well he crashes uh, through with his but, horse, right? Yeah, Ethel Fred then kills him. Right, so yes. here we go. That was, was that, was that winter? Yeah, we've gone into winter, I think. Yeah, I think, I I think that we've heard it was really cold that night. Yeah, saying. it was really cold. Um, and we're at the end of the show. We're all exhausted and we're doing night shoots. You know, oh, yeah. It, it's pretty full on. Uh, it takes years off you. Anyway, but yeah, that was a, that was a great moment. I'm trying to remember who was directing that scene. Oh, that was Richard Senior, I think. Yeah, it was. Um, to be honest, I thought when we were shooting it, I was thinking we're not we're not on top of this because oh. we. I, I had to put a load of light long way away from on top of hills and all kinds of stuff. There was a lot of setup time, and I think we were a bit short on extras and stuff but the final scene uh, when it was cut it, it, i i wasn't confident about that actually and i was ha- happily surprised I, I was pleased to see the results and sort of uh, we managed to get it on board but you're right it was a good shot there another moment that i from the battle first battle of season three um it's just a small moment but when the shields are clashing the camera pans back as the shields like sequentially hit the wall. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It goes and we yeah. we come back. Yeah, that was that was my good friend uh, Eric Leisenborg, uh Swedish director, who's absolutely lovely chap. But Ian Clark was operating that. We came up with the idea and said, look, that's great, classic class. All handheld, you know. Wow. So, you can imagine if you're on a big movie or a really expensive TV show, that would have been probably done in a slightly different way but because of our style and our reality if you get it right handheld you know it's a hell of a lot quicker and uh, it looks brilliant if you get it right it just takes a while to get it right yeah um but yeah i love that shot as well we did we did a lot of shield ward stuff i think we needed to move away from it slightly which i think we did but i know it was of the time but it became a little bit repetitive so um yeah, I think we thought of ways to uh, make it up all that shit. When you do that shot, is there something that's running backwards with the camera? Yeah, it's always running backwards. But, wow. you know, it depends on the ground. I think we probably leveled the ground for him. So, you know, he probably has a strap around his shoulder and you're, you're holding the camera sort of like this with a monitor and you're running back and you're supporting. You've gotcha. still got, you know, you're using your arms as a bit of suspension. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a good looking shot, but you know, done in the hand. Wow. Speaking of the the running backwards too, it reminds me of another scene we were talking about Colby last night was uh, yeah the scene from season one when they're in the marshlands after Alfred has mm. retreated, and yes. Uchi is trying to lure some Danes into traps throughout the the swamp. Yes, and they're running yeah. through those weeds, and it like the camera is right in front of Utrecht, uh running through yeah. those high weeds like. How did, how did you do that without falling into the traps yourself? <laughs> well, I, <laughs> and getting shot with arrows. <laughs> and getting shot with arrows. Well, we, I, well, a lot of the arrows are put in afterwards. Right. Um, obviously, <laughs> you just have people doing this the whole time and they put them in. But, uh, yeah, there was a certain amount of, of running. I think I operated on that. Yeah, I think I did. I think I was running through the marshes. Um, but you just, basically, what I was doing was, in those events, I'd shoot it slightly wider. Okay. So 
and I'd be running and it's, I'm looking at my footing. I've got an eye on the monitor, but I'm also looking at my footing. I'm not locked into the monitor. Do you see what I mean? And I'm yeah. also looking at coming up and I'm running with the camera like that as fast as I can. Now, to, you can then slightly reframe. If you shoot it wider, there's a certain amount of resolution that you can reframe. So, you know, okay. it might feel a little bit loose, but we can then zoom in and slightly stabilize it if it's a little bit too rough. So, you know, there's tricks to get around that. But, yeah, it's just to run through with the camera is brilliant. I love it. You know, yeah. the only problem, you can't sort of reset. That's the only problem. You have to see sort of moving through the reeds. But, you know, it was like the Amazon jungle down there. So we had sort of acres of it to do it in. You must have been exhausted at the end of that day. <laughs> that I, I, Yeah, everyone was exhausted. Oh, my goodness. Just me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But... um. No, it is cool because, I mean, you can imagine you could have also made the choice where the camera's stationary and you just have them running by or, or something no, else. No, that, that, that was, you, you've hit the nail on the head. The whole thing about Last Kingdom is we're with them. We go where they go. Yeah. That was the next thing was, you know, you, you're going into a room on someone's shoulder. So the actor, the, the audience discovers as the actor discovers. Yes. So you don't, you, don't, you don't cut to a room an empty room with a door in it and because you know that door's going to open and someone's going to walk in right and nick was quite good at exploring what we call the stumble whereby you know you're walking towards the door with someone's shoulder and somebody comes through it it's got nothing to do with anything but as a viewer you're like what's happening what why is that guy but you know it's just some guy passing through as yeah. opposed to a stop we always joke about you know two big doors low angle shot two doors yeah. What's going to happen? They're going to open. Do you know what I mean? It's a bit yeah. obvious. Whereas we're trying to be with them the whole time. And so that's what keeps the pace and the energy going. Well, it's cool. It makes you feel like that you're there and yeah. that you are, the camera are our eyes and we're there. And one time in the first episode, I feel like we're Uhtred's eyes. When young Uhtred is talking to Raven up at the top of um, that balcony there, and yeah. Raven asks him, oh, who's sitting in the middle of the hall? Is it the big man, the small man? But the way the camera, like, it kind of shakily pans out, it just really feels like we're in Uhtred's head seeing this for the first time. Was that, again. sorry, just remind me, was that season four? That's uh, season four? The season one, like the first episode of season one. Oh, when, oh young Uhtred, Tom, Tom. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah. But when he looks down, um, when he looks down at the... Yeah, yeah he sees, uh, right? like... Yeah. Abba, uh, Rune Tempte down there, and Raven's telling him, like, oh, don't fight Abba, never fight Abba. Yeah. Um, it just feels like the camera is Uhtred's gaze as he's looking over. It's well, really cool. Well, yeah. that, that, I guess that's just, you know, a point of view needs to feel like a point of view. So, you know, you feel it as, as the operator, you try to do how you would feel it, you know. Um, how would he look at it? It's what you think is right when you're when you're doing it, uh, 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 the reality of it, and not to over glamorize. That was the, that was our thing. You know, we we hardly shot anything at high speed. You know, and if there was, you know, no one would be jumping in high speed. Oh, you know, it'd all be someone's hit, bang, the hit like yes. um, like Matthew McFadden when he gets hit by oh. a horse. That's another. Another one of Nick's tricks, you know, the sword through, they hit a bit of horse, like, what's going on? Yeah. Yeah, so it's all, there was no glamour, glamorization of it. And like, when we're in Ragnar's barn, got you, when he look, when young Tom looks down and all that carnage yeah. is going on, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the woman going up and down and falling, and yeah. It was very real, I thought, the whole, that, yeah. you know, you thought, God, this is what they did. Yeah. But it was not it was not glamorized. This is what I keep going back to. You know, it's just happening there. It's just in the background. You're with the actor, the, the, you're interested in the dialogue, but in the background, some woman is being violently raped or being pulled to the ceiling and being garroted or something. It's sort of incidental as opposed to cutting to it. You know what I mean? To go, look, yeah. there's a woman who's just held oh, seen. It's just happening in the background. It's quite quick. That yeah. I love that. And I love, love the choice you guys make because every time young Uhtred moves his head, it's a view from on top of the balcony and it's shaky yeah. as if it's his eyes. And it's just yeah. how we, d we discover all this Dane culture and this, this, this like yeah. you said, the carnage 
as Uhtred is really a cool choice, I thought. Instead of, like you say, cutting down to where it's happening and doing a scene like that. Yeah, I don't know. It's just a cool choice. Yeah. But it's not, it's not you know, I, I'm there. I'm holding camera. But, you know, Nick, Nick has got a lot to uh, take credit for for all that. But, you know, that, and also Nick, he's a great collaborator as well because – you know, he let God knows why, but he does listen to me sometimes. But he comes up with these great ideas, and then I'll say, "Well, yeah, what about this?" And he'll go, "No, that's shit." Uh, but I always feel like I can bring something to him. I'm not, I'm not thinking, "Is he going to think this is stupid or something?" Right. And you know, every now and again, he'll go, "Yeah, that's quite a good idea. Let's do that." So that was nice that we always had that, and that was with all the directors actually. You know, I always felt, you know, uh, once the other directors came on, they did look to ask my opinion and uh, it was really nice it's a nice cool. feeling to feel like you've got something to offer and to help and cool. they were respectful of what i've gone on before which um which gives you that confidence to be able to stand up and talk and and uh, be listened to and hopefully come up with some good ideas cool and i'm sure there's other environments that you work in where the director's probably like no you just do what i say you know point it here or something like that i'm sure that could happen well, too right yeah, it, 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 there is. There are times. There are times like that, um, and it's just I work best at, uh, in a collaboration. What, sure. What's not great is when the director looks at you and goes, "What are we going to do next?" And you're like, well, "I don't know." But how do you see the team? Do you know? <laughs> I, I want to feel the director's input. What What's their vision? How do they want to do it? And I'll make it work. It's sort of you know they come up with a, the thing. I'll work out. Have we got time for it? Like with Jamie's one, you know, I really wanted to do it, but I had to work out exactly how we were going to do it. Yeah. And then we ended up with this really cool shot. So, and yeah. that was together, we worked it out, you know. Um, it's problem solving, like yeah. you said. Problem solving and collaboration with, with good people that respect each other, basically. What was the biggest changes from season one to your time on season three as far as uh, your well, role? The, the lighting. And how it like. was the lighting. The light for me personally. I I had I learned to light quicker, more realistic, but um, and uh, it just looked a bit more uh, photographically correct, should we say? Um, and it was a bit more pleasing on the eye, but it was still it was rugged and rough, but it was more pleasing on the eye. Whereas uh, gotcha. I had to do a lot of work in the grade with the top light and see in episode one and two but you know nick got the show going like that and then i managed to get the lighting right so for me it was the lighting and we and we settled the camera down a little bit more you know we're still on the run and, and stuff right but we but it was you know we didn't always have to be running right. around like a, a little yeah. bit more refined so there yeah there's times when it needs to settle and uh, I think we found those times. Totally. Yeah. Going back to that scene where we were talking about earlier in season three, uh, when Edward's making his decision. But before that, we, we see Uhtred and the gang. They're out on the, the field. They're battling. And then the camera pans slowly into the woods. There's a guy there. They keep going. There's more <laughs> men. And then all of a sudden, you see Alfred. Like, oh. that to me, I was like, holy shit. This is, like, the, like <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's good. I mean... I'm trying. I'm remembering. I know exactly the shot you're talking about, and I can remember planning it with John, John East, and you know, for me at that point, it was just another battle. And now we're doing it in the snow in the middle of winter, <laughs> and I was just like, Jesus. Uh, but you know, the actors were amazing in that because they, you know they were they weren't wearing that much, and it was really cold, really muddy, and the makeup department and costume department we're having to sort of recycle the clothes you know that were virtually sodden and you know wow. it was just really really hard on everyone but you know we got that drama when he's there you are right up there like what's he gonna do you know it was really really strong oh yeah, yeah I'm, I'm proud of that yeah that is a very cool shot now like we mentioned before runa tempte told us that you would put yourself into some positions that, you know, you'd be in the shield wall. And I think he also mentioned that you might like get behind a shield while somebody's whacking at it. What's the craziest position you or even someone from your team has put yourselves into to get a shot? Well, I, uh, I thought about that. I suppose that 
you know, being run over by a horse with a right. handheld camera bike or something. I don't, I don't know many people that have done that. Yeah. And, you know, it, it feels very real, that. Um, what else? I mean, to be honest, when I was in the battles, yeah, I had, I had one hand in the camera, my eye to the eyepiece, and I've got the other eye open because I'm trying to look at what's going on, you know, if I'm going to get hit. And I'm sort of pushing people out of the way to get in. And, you know, sometimes you do take a couple of blows, but I put sort of sort of some protection on. But wow. yeah, it was just fighting the way through it. And you know, some of the some of the some of the extras on the stunt men was like going, Well, I've just belted someone in the back to get them out of the way to get in. But it really feels like you're in it. And that was that was the good <laughs> thing. But I'd said to me I'd said to you know, when we when we started planning it that, you know, they should all be doing their thing. And I'm just going to barge through. As long as it's safe, I'm just going to barge through. And, and But people shouldn't be mindful of the camera so much. You know, right. I want to I'll take the knock. Take it. It's not like, oh, it's not the camera. We can't do it. Unless it's a key point. Unless it's a key point in the storytelling or the narrative. To suddenly have the camera not like that, that's no good. But in the battle, if you're charging through and you get a knock and a hit and you're still in. <laughs> That's all part of it. That that's good. We like that. That's awesome. But it's, that's the thing that which is not sort of normal, you know. We yeah. really sort of we sort of put it out there that you know the camera can get hit. You know, we're, we're enjoying the mistake, the 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 stumble. It's all yeah. real. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, those are the efforts to make it feel like you're there for the audience. Yeah, you know we but. What I would say was that, you know, I, we did try to, we were mindful of it. To begin with, it was just like, wah! But then we became mindful of the fact that when it does happen, it's going to be at the right time. Right. You know, you know it's luck thing. It's going back to the luck, you know. You get the hit at the right time, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't rehearsed. You've got a great bit of um, great shot. Totally. That's it. And, and there's like a couple moments like when Abba's fighting and like you're like behind the shield and the axe is coming down. And then again with Siegfried at the end of season two, where the axe is again coming down and you're like behind the shield. Um, are you doing that? Like, are you like on yeah, the ground? We, like, yeah, we were, we were in that. Yeah, we'd always, the camera was always manned. We always had someone, I don't know if it was me, but it would have been one of the operators. Gotcha. Uh, but yeah, we we just it, we're in it all together, and obviously that helps with visual effects afterwards. You know, someone could be, you know, they won't have anything in their hand; they're going like that. It's quite easy to put that blur in to look like the axe. If you've seen someone holding an axe and suddenly you got the close up, they're going like that. It's an axe, you know, even though it's a bit of rubber or whatever. It is. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's just all those tricks that we use, you know, to sell the reality of it. Um, Wow. which we just developed over the seasons, really. You know, is there any future projects you have coming up to look forward to? Or, and maybe goals that you have? I'm, I'm just looking now to work on jobs that I want to do with my friends and uh, cool. colleagues that I know. Uh, and, you know, like Jamie, I, I want to do something else with Jamie again. And I guess my goal is to shoot a big movie. And I've been okay. this close to a couple of them. Uh, but you know it's difficult to get the the big sh the big one the big hit. It's so yeah. it's so ridiculously competitive. Yeah. But uh, it, I I don't feel it's too far away. But and do you have yeah. anything uh, to look forward to coming out soon, or that you're going to be working on soon? No, I I, I took I, sorry. That's what I was going to say. I took a sabbatical last year. Okay. Because I was a little done with you know I've been in Budapest for four years mm. and. Enough was it. That's why I didn't do season four. I, gotcha. you know, I had to, I had to step away, personal reasons, and uh, you know, I just wanted to do something different. So I've had a year in the, the French Alps, uh, nice. and because of COVID, that's extending now to probably the new year. And I'll look to do something, hopefully, good drama. I've had a few interviews, so I'm waiting to hear, but everything's sort of stalled at the moment. But yeah, uh, looking forward to starting up again and working with nice people. Awesome. What I might do, if they have me back for season five, I might, uh, I might return for, uh, <laughs> for, uh, for one night only. 
yeah. if my wife lets me, I might return for one night only. But I need to be asked, you know. Absolutely, but we hope they do. I'm personally someone who is very interested in making films, and you've definitely been an inspiration for me um, seeing oh, your work. So, you know, thank you for the work you've done on The Last Kingdom. And we don't want to keep you, you any any longer today. If there's anything else you'd like to say before you go. But. Well, I was just going to say, what, what got you guys into The Last Kingdom? Because, you know, it wasn't, wasn't out there, really. It was just sort of knocking your back. And then since, you know, it's definitely grown and grown and grown, the show, in the last few years. What hooked you in? Uh, Steve, do you want to take this one? Or you want me to- <laughs> no, yeah. So, I mean, it was, like, like we said uh, before we talked, we mentioned, it was just something that kept popping up on Netflix, recommended us for a watch. And... It wasn't really something that stuck out for me, but, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but uh, after we got into it though, first episode yeah. was so interesting and the second one hooked us. I mean, it was, it was the, the characters, it was the humor, it was the fighting, the action. And the feel. Uh, yeah. The feel, it was emotional yeah. too. It wasn't just in the villains, the Danes, they were dynamic. They weren't just, er, kill. Er, they, they were the yeah. They were the guys you wanted to be, you know. Nick, I think Nick said they're they're the rock stars. Rock stars. You're rooting for the <laughs> yeah, Saxons, the but star. you want to be a Dane. Yeah. No, that was an- another one of Nick's calls. You know, he said, "I want them all to be Danish. They've got to be Scandinavian." Uh, and it was a really brilliant call. It really, really was. Okay. Um, but listen, I just wanted to sign off, uh, just in an incredibly positive way. I know this was supposed to be about cinematography, but it, it was. In order for cinematography to look good, uh, it also comes down to all the other departments as well. Mm-hmm. You know, I just got a camera and uh, it is a collaborative event and uh, I met friends for life. The actors were brilliant. The makeup, costume, everyone. Yeah, it was uh, yeah, it was a collaborative thing and that makes the cinematography look good. So, you know, I can't, I don't want to take, you know, all the credit for something that we all did together. No, but you were a big part of it too. And uh, we recognize that. And we believe that, you know, the actors get a lot of credit, but a lot of people behind the camera deserve their recognition um, for the work that they did. So uh, thank you for the work you did on The Last Kingdom and making it. It's our favorite show. It's going to be a lot of other people's favorite shows as it continues to be discovered. Um, yeah. For sure. So, but yeah. Well, but thank, thank you. For having, thanks for having me. It thank you for a- coming on. If you want to check out more Chaz Bain, we're going to link his uh, website down below. You can check him out on Instagram. Anywhere else they can find you, Chaz? Uh, no, just, uh, just that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. We hope you stay with the screen Chronicles, follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and subscribe on YouTube and otherwise goodbye from screen Chronicles and Chaz Bain. Thanks for having me and uh, good luck with all the others. Thank you, Chaz. I'll be watching. All right. right.